and things called things like wine label solutions are super important. We built something for an insurer or telco retailer. They own the client, you own the technology, and you license it. So you've got to have big picture thinking where you're saying, am I okay sacrificing margins for higher volume? And as entrepreneurs, we're always trained to think, what can I get today, this week, next month, next quarter? We never think big term. And the reality is if you want to work with the big people in the industry, you have to think, how do I create value for you and how do I make you look better? And then in turn, you create value for yourself. Um, when you look at acquiring customers, so VCs will often ask you, what is your customer acquisition strategy? And I'm sure you've heard this before. There's a framework called the R framework, where you acquire, you retain, you, so you acquire, you activate, you retain, you refer, and then you create revenue. Often, founders spend so little time and money on understanding how to acquire customers. And they'll hire someone with a fancy degree in marketing to be the chief marketing officer. I actually think, I've been doing this for way too long now, the most important job in a tech startup is probably marketing and sales. Every job is a sales job. And you assume that marketing means, oh, I'm gonna control my Facebook, Instagram, and social media accounts, no. Acquiring customers requires a certain number of, certain type of skill. Activating customers, different skill step. How do I prevent customers from journey? How do I get every customer that signs up to my product or service to refer another three companies, uh, customers? How do I incentivize them to do so and not drop off? Good VCs, and there aren't many of them on this continent, will look at those metrics. They'll look at your cost of customer acquisition to your lifetime value. They'll look at your growth versus your churn. They'll look at your drop-off rates. They'll, they'll look at something called a viral coefficient on referrals. How do you incentivize your top customers to stay with you? Those sorts of things are exceptionally important and startup founders pay too little attention to that. Right. Um, when it comes to what, I could speak about this for two hours, but I'm gonna try and cut it short. What do you, in the, I grew up in the, in the early 80s and early 90s. Not sure how many of you grew up in that era as well. But back in the day, if you started a company, the two most important attributes of how you were valued was either you were the cheapest alternative in the market for the average product, or you had incredible quality and people were completely price insensitive. So you either had high quality or you were the lowest price or on the lower range. That's how businesses were valued, price and quality. And then you look at 2010 with the, with the explosion of the sharing economy, the gig economy, big data, and the millennial and the Gen Z generation. If you look at the top 20 most valued companies in the world, from Amazon to Facebook to Google to you know, the second tier, the, the Stripes, the, 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 the Spotify, etc., they, they get two things really right. They really, really understand their customers. And the reality is customers in the last 10 to 15 years are less sensitive to price and quality. What they really care about is convenience, and time. If you can save people time, when's the last time anyone here watched a 30 minute video during working hours, Monday through Friday? That wasn't work related. People don't have time, right? The most, take for example Amazon. Right? Amazon's worth close to, to two trillion dollars. Do you guys know that more than 60% of adult Americans have Amazon Prime. You guys know what Amazon Prime is, right? Yeah. What is Amazon? So Amazon spent a ton of money for, um, in, over the last 10 years hiring the most smart data scientists and the, most smart, and the smartest human anthropo anthropological psychologists. People don't talk about this. Amazon spends tons of money to literally go and understand how human beings in the US and all the world think. It's borderline, 
borderline manipulation, right? I'm not a medical medical guy, but I know enough about it. I know that dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline are the three most powerful. Um, uh, gosh, what's the word? Yeah, hormones in your endocrine system. If you go and buy, let's say I go and buy, I don't know, I can't see anything yet, but let's say a beautiful mug of coffee and I buy it on Amazon Prime. And if you're, we, we had a few e-commerce companies here last night, yesterday. If I buy something and Amazon Prime delivers to me and I pay $20 for it, a nice beautiful mug or a vase or something, what is the traditional mentality if I receive something and I don't like it? I want to return it. What are you going to say as an e-commerce company? We had six e-commerce pitches yesterday. Oh, you're going to take pictures of it, put it back in packaging, write it in the claims form, submit it back, and we'll evaluate whether or not we can replace it. What does Amazon do? No, it's fine. <laughs> Just tell us what you don't like about it, and we'll get you a new mug or a new cup or whatever within 24 hours. Right? What Amazon does exceptionally well is they understand their customers so well that they tap into this need and this desire, the dopamine effect, right? Where people will keep buying because they understand that their client, in this case Amazon, knows them so well that they will keep feeding the beast. And in everything from Spotify to Netflix, I mean these are all B2C companies but they have b 2 c elements to it. Irrespective of whether your client is a consumer or a business, the startups today that do exceptionally well know how their customers think, feel, behave intrinsically well. And how many of you as entrepreneurs spend time understanding your customers versus building the most beautiful products? And that, my friends, is how VCs think. They want you to know as a founder how much your customers want what you do. No one's going to ask you for, there's a famous quote that says, no one asks you for a six inch hole. They ask you, so no one asks you for a six inch drill, they ask you for a six inch hole. Right? So I don't care how you're going to solve my problem. What I do care is about, is my problem fixed? And that's what VCs want to hear from you as entrepreneurs. <coughs> Quickly talk about some of the things we VC look for. So everyone's spoken about team, I'm not going to spend time talking about it. Um, your total addressable market, some high level numbers. If you're not able to target a market of at least $100 million by year five, it's very hard for a VC to take you seriously. Right? From, a, from a traction standpoint, different, different startups in different industries have different ways of evaluating traction. So for example, if you're a digital bank, anywhere in the world, your traction is almost entirely linked to your monthly active users, even if your revenue metrics aren't that great. If you're a payments processor, what's more important is your monthly transaction volume. If you're an e-commerce company, it's your GMV, your gross merchandise volume. And it's very hard for founders that don't understand metrics in different industries to be competitive. But all else being equal, if you can, at a steady state, get to fifty dollars to $100,000 in monthly recurring revenue, that's when you should be ready for a Series A round. Um, I'll, I'll just skip past these slides, I'm going to talk about, yeah. I'm going to talk briefly about unit economics, because this is stuff that most VCs will never talk about. Unfortunately, most VCs in the continent tend to be from the private equity ilk, and they work in corporate finance, they're ex-bankers, and don't understand how to build companies. The really good VCs on the continent come from a venture building, an accelerator background, or a former founders, to Ashwin's point yesterday. Is based in the United States or Europe or wherever the big economies, or are we going to capture it ourselves as entrepreneurs and as investors? So that's uh, what I'd say. My name is T. John and I run Worry Ventures. Thank you, Zach. So, hello, everyone. I'm Uma Bas. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Yavante Express. Actually, um, you know, 
I'm the little guy in here, and um, I'm a second level startup founder. And with Giovante, we connect local careers with local commerce to solve the biggest problems in emerging markets. We definitely leverage uh, agent networks, you know, using gig economy with independent casual carriers to deliver packages from point to point until the last month delivery for e-commerce retailers, businesses, and individuals. So I'm more likely, you know, the guy that which is saying you can get a small rat, you can slap an elephant. So it's literally a image. So we will discuss about it within this conversation. Thank you so much. I'm going to start off talking about something I mentioned in, in the talk just before this is the importance of how startup founders can work closely with large corporates. And we've seen a complete revolution in Nigeria and South Africa and Kenya and to a certain extent in Egypt, where you had large telcos, banks, insurance companies, retailers start working with startups like Yobante right there. And it gives them huge access to, to channel customers. Francophone Africa. Africa. There hasn't been a lot of corporate startup collaboration, and that's one of the reasons why startups may not have had the scale of their counterparts uh, in Nigeria, for example. Is there enough being done? Um, I'm going to start with you, Greg, um, because you probably have more and more experience in this, in, in this space. How can corporate Africa in French West Africa work and work with startups to incentivize them? To, uh, to grow and scale and benefit everyone, which is the end consumer and person. Some thoughts around that. It's a legitimate question. Thank you. Uh, the answer is tough because uh, that's, I think that there is something which is changing now. It's uh, the mindset of the corporate. Um, and uh, in from Open Africa, we, I think we, we see uh, the corporates understanding that uh, the innovation is coming from startups and not from their labs, and it's uh, it's quite new. So uh, we see um, coverage like like Orange uh, building open uh, open innovation programs uh, to try to connect with startups. Uh, so there are a lot of initiatives just to try to connect and to understand the ecosystem. Uh, so there is a uh, a coding school, and we have our lectures. Um, but the, the main issue is how to, to go beyond the connection and to start to collaborate. And this is the main challenge. Um, and I think the, what is at stake is the mindset of the middle management. Because you know you have people within the corporates uh, who are happy to be uh, in, the, in that big corporate. And they think, and they still think, some of them still think that uh, innovation will come from the, the group and, uh, and they feel that uh, if there is something from outside they could lose their job or they could uh, lose the, the momentum and so on and, uh, and the, the structure uh, overall is, uh, is still quite uh, is, uh, resisting and, uh, but what I saw those two last years is that now at every step of the management people are just changing, and they, they understand that they have to to to, uh, to to collaborate, but they need a method, and that's what we are trying to do within our is to explain them how to talk to an entrepreneur, how to talk to a founder, and uh, and and uh, they understand now that we cannot take more than some weeks to take a decision with an entrepreneur, and it's it's one of the mission of Omarshva, for instance, is the one of the main value proposition of Omarshva is to prove to an entrepreneur that we can take a decision in less than three months. Yeah. That's still something challenging internally, but that was the main value proposition. And I think it's the right mindset, mindset that we have to, to, to promote within corporate, but um, um, there are not enough corporate trying to, to, to work with startups to do that. Jen, you want to add something to that? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think Orange, uh, quite frankly, is an outlier. They've been active in on continent for, for decades. Um, the reality is that there's a large portion of global corporates who are sleeping on Africa, to be quite frank. Um, so I had a conversation uh, with PayPal. Uh, um, I was in San Francisco 
and uh, I spoke to their head of Asia, and I asked them, are you in Africa? And PayPal is one of the biggest fintechs in the United States. And they said, no, they're not in Africa yet. Um, and I was like, how can you overlook a $4 trillion economy as a fintech? And um, two years after that, they made their first investment into a company called Tala, which is a fintech operating in East Africa. So the point is that these global corporates will come. And they can come in one of two ways. They can, they can come and set up an office. So if you think about it, uh, you hear about uh, Twitter opening an office in, uh, in Ghana. In Ghana. Um, that's, that's a great step. The other way they can enter a market is by an acquisition. Right? And that's what we as VCs like. Um, so if you think about Paystack, that's Stripe coming into the market. They didn't set up an office. They just acquired an existing startup. And you know, to Zach's point, by, by nurturing those relationships early, that's how the corporate relationships eventually um, become acquisitions. And that's basically the name of the game for, uh, for some of this startup investing is to, to reach a, a point where you can exit. And you don't necessarily have to when you exit to step down as a CEO. So the, the Paystack guys are still there as CEOs running their companies. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, you know right now this is the biggest opportunity in Africa in, uh, in Africa um, where I think uh, if you look at you know we talked about Amazon before um, you know the biggest news that came out of the past week or so is the, in my opinion is the appointment of the new Federal Trade Commission uh, chairperson in the United States named Vina Khan who is an antitrust um, kind of uh, Legis uh, a lawyer, and she wrote about Amazon. And Amazon is outcompeting the entire United States market. 46% of online sales go through Amazon. And if, if we don't re recognize the power of digital in, the United, in Africa, that same thing is going to happen. And what that really means is that in order for our economies to be competitive, they have to digitize. And they will digitize either from within or they will digitize in partnership with uh, tech startups like Yvante, like Café Crea, like uh, many others. Sorry, that's, uh, that's all I'll say. Um, quick, quick comment from, from uh, Omar. So um, my point of view as the founder of Yvante Express is um, mainly um, we have few business clients, I mean few corporate business clients, right? Large corporate. How it happens, that was a simple process. They do a public binding. We submit this. Every, you know, you have corporate that are submitting, and we provide what we got the best. So um, what we are providing the value that we added, and it comes out that we were, had been selected. So we did it with BMI. So that's how it works in Francophone Africa, but that's not how it should be working. So the thing is, compared to the other ecosystems, for instance, in South Africa or in Nigeria. Or you have, a, you know, the simple thing is, from one hand, you have corporates which have, I mean, very likely large or unlimited resources and do not have, I mean, um, good innovation. That's that's reality, right? And from another hand, you have startups which are totally the opposite, right? They don't have a lot of resources, but are so innovative. So, and you know, um, putting these two world together will be, I mean, benefiting for everyone. What I'm saying is like taking advantage of those huge resources by running POCs, by running, um, I mean, um, that's proof of concepts, right? Pilots, and that's the job of incubators and accelerators. So for our experience, we did not make it in Senegal, but while we was at the startup camp, you know, us being able to be directly in contact and benefiting from the, the dentists, the largest world front in the world, that was because you know, we was a part of the accelerator that made that happen. So that's the kind of things that we definitely need in our ecosystem. Here, in French speaking African countries. I'm seeing that a lot of efforts are being made by Nader and it's on the way, but definitely we need to move on to that to make sure that everyone is benefiting from it because we're seeing as a result what's definitely that could do for the startups and as well for the corporates. And if, if, even if it's not directly, um, I mean, for the benefit of those corporate, but they have
clients that could benefit from the innovation that the startups could um, put on the table. So that's my point. Yeah, that's a very good point. And that actually dovetails into the next sort of section here, which is, you know, a, a lot of investors, be them corporates or VCs or angel investors, look for clean structures to invest in. I'm going to get to you, to you in a second. So things that founders often consider to be not relevant. So tell me about your CRM systems, your IP protection. IP is a whole new section. Your legal, your audit, how you set up, what your distribution agreements are with suppliers. Um, that is where accelerators and incubators are super important, as you as, as you rightly mentioned. What is being done in Francophone Africa to educate not just the founders but also investors about how to do this sort of corporate startup matchmaking process? But just talk to me a little bit about the importance of structure and. And um, yeah, this structure before before even thinking about investments. So I'm going to come back to a few things that you mentioned and you mentioned. Basically, okay, I'm going to start by you. I love your last chart. This is part of the course that I, I give to my entrepreneurs. Why? Is because the way I see building a startup or anything like this today or here, in three years you can be here in the middle. What sets in the middle are the skill sets and the building. Yeah. According to it, so I don't know if you know, people uh, like reading this stuff here. But there is this book called, called Flow, very interesting, where he says the uh, human brain is happy only when we upgrade the challenge just a little bit beyond ourselves, and we upgrade our skill set permanently to actually follow that yeah. upgrade, that challenge. So uh, I like to work work about that, and the we we work ourselves is also building startup startups and very often from day one we're talking to the corporate as you say. So we actually build the step stones with the corporate saying okay if you want that company in three years to look like that, we work with the entrepreneur who at some time gets a coaching all of the experience with us who are more on the operation side with the corporate was more on the direction side and three years they literally have the term sheet on the table. And usually, frankly speaking, we've got very, very fast traction uh, around in that model. Um, so what is really interesting is everyone gains from it because as we're talking about that with Celine process vision a bit earlier, uh, sometimes startups are more adequate to actually build the sub tools that the teams need because they're faster, they're easier, um, so their mentality is more um, made for the um, alpha beta test. They're more flexible, they're more agile, and they actually uh, can, I, I, I call that the Lego, the Lego system. Yeah. They can put in the, the small parts of the Lego faster. So that's how I see um, myself building here at least, and uh, that's what we're building at least at the moment with ITC. And we try to do that with that there. You know, it's, it's, I like to be on skill set. Yeah. I mean, so things like, for example, the, the Jack Ma Foundation with the Netpreneur Prize, they would literally spend hours after hours educating. And you'd be surprised how many founders and investors just aren't aware of standard operating procedures in this industry. So, you know, it's, 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 it's extremely important for, I mean, not just I'm keen to get everyone's views, is in Francophone Africa, there needs to be knowledge transfer sessions where people are educated about you know, the, the, the disclaimers you see, venture capital is a risky asset class. You can you have all these all these sort of you know checks and crosses written down. People don't understand what venture investing is, what angel investing is, and what proper risk return trade-offs are. So within the Francophone African system, how can we how can we get the different players to understand how important innovation funding is um, without it being too... I mean, there's also a certain element of fall of fear of missing out, right? So how can we how can we spread that um, spread that knowledge? Um, I think um, the, the situation now in Hong Kong Africa is very, very... is um, changed a lot. Uh, I think the two last years, the, the deep flow I received uh, three years ago is totally different from the deep flow I received now. Yeah. And, uh, and I think 
to, to, and we have to acknowledge that the most entrepreneurs now are in front of an Africa, uh, outside of Lingo, and they, they, they learn a lot on, by, by themselves. Yeah. And uh, and front of an Africa belongs to the same world and, and uh, benefit from the same content. content. So, um, and, uh, and, and we are, as a VC in front of an Africa, I receive a call from Anglophone VCs, uh, I think at least once per week, uh, to look for the community flow in front of an Africa. So, for me, front of an Africa is no more this uh, area where Anglophone VCs were quite afraid of because they didn't understand the legal regulatory area, time is changing. Um, and, uh, and I think that this year um, we'll see some nice Series A and probably more uh, Series B. Um, what is the, the next uh, let's say 18 months? But which will put front of Africa on the radar. And, and there is a huge opportunity here because I see a lot of entrepreneurs scaling from day one to from Senegal to Côte d'Ivoire, for instance. And uh, what Point Afrique said yesterday, uh, it's not easy, but probably easier to scale from one country to another here in that area. It's true. And there are not so many places in Africa that can say that the region is a real yeah. market. Yeah, that's the, that's the opportunity of this place. So sort of dovetailing into that, I'd like to get to John's views on this, is how important so two things, IP protection, holding company on co structures, often not valued enough, but super important to investors, right, from a structure and protection perspective. And then I'll talk about exits. And there's nothing more comforting to an investor or funds knowing that there is a clear way in which you can create an exit opportunity. So let's talk about IP. Um, how do you think, or how important is IP protection? So I just want to add one little bit of context. Uh, perhaps from my accent, you can see that I'm, I'm a dual heritage uh, citizen. So I actually have a, a Senegalese passport and an American passport, uh, reflecting my parents who met in France. Um, so, um, but, uh, you know, I actually registered my trademark with OAPI. OAPI is the West African Intellectual Property uh, Association. Um, and I think there is some role for for um, for IP, um, I guess depending on how how mature the tech is uh, that you're dealing with, if you're going to try to brand uh, to, to protect some sort of uh, information technology product, that's probably done. Um, uh, but going to the question about the structure, so the reason I brought up the fact that I you know spent some time you know my youth in the United States and my adulthood in in, uh, in Africa is that. Um, you know, the past three years, I've been spending a lot of time in the Bay Area. And, um, you know, if you think about the importance of um, this notion of a business cluster. So if you're going to be a hedge fund, you probably better, better off be in uh, New York. Um, if you're going to be a fashion person, uh, Italy is actually the, the place to be. And so there's some, uh, there's some importance to having a linkage to where the capital of entrepreneurial um, investing and innovation, which is uh, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. Um, and so the point is, if you want to enable global investors, a lot of times they're not comfortable with the structures uh, of the OHADA. You know, um, when we talk about Francophone, Francophone really is referring to two regions, uh, the uh, UMWA, which is the eight country West African, and then the, the CIMAC, which is the Central African, which is 14 countries. But the cool thing about these regions is that there's one legal structure, it's called the OHADA, and it's harmonized across all the countries. The problem is global investors don't know and appreciate how that law works, and so we've been encouraging startups to have uh, a global holding uh, company, uh, meaning a company in Delaware or um, in London or in Paris, uh, where the global investors um, uh, understand and are comfortable with that. And so, for me, the name of the game in entrepreneurship, in, in startups, is liquidity. You have to be able to attract a lot of interest from a lot of a broad segment of, of investors. Um, and if you close that door, 
by being headquartered in, you know, let's say, uh, one country of the Uruguay, then uh, you're not going to have as much liquidity. And so let's say, tangibly, one of your angel investors who put in a 25K check and is expecting a secondary uh, by the Series A, um, you know, if that secondary is not going to come about because you're not able to accommodate uh, a global investor, that you, you kind of, uh, you know, from, from day one, it's not going to work. Um, so until um, the uh, legal systems in uh, our part of the world are set up correctly to accommodate and uh, work with, with startup companies, I think it's okay to have um, a headquarters elsewhere um, just to be a holding company. And that's what, that's probably 95% of startups have that structure. And if you don't, it's like you don't want global investors. Yeah, and then, again, just to be clear here, yeah, the, 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 the issue is not about you not being patriotic to your own country, because that's the, that's the argument that we always get, oh, I don't want to have uh, be in the US. Sure, but then you're going to expose yourself to five funds versus cut your patriotism by a little bit, you're not cutting it, be more realistic. I now have potentially 100 VC funds that would be interested in me. I create jobs locally in Senegal or wherever you are. I pay taxes here locally. I just have my investments going into a holding company in the US or in the UK or in Singapore. But you don't get taxed on equity, you get taxed on profit. Right? So it's simple concepts like this that you know someone was sleeping in business school that didn't understand this. So that works really well and it makes investments a lot easier. So there needs to be more education on that. Same same for you. Yeah. Um, but I, I think we need to just to, to, re, to remind that it's not I think necessary to do this at the first day of the company because yeah. I see a lot of entrepreneurs spending some money on that issue while they should focus on traction. Correct. So Correct. Uh, I think the right time is uh, is once you are raising quite a significant amount of money because it's it's not difficult to to uh, to, to, to move to buy it's difficult but uh, yeah. do, do this when you have resources to, to fund that. Right. And also remember it's not about um, uh, you don't you don't have to move your IP offshore immediately. What's important is to have your economic ownership by a US entity. So you can be, for example, Yavante Express is a Senegalese company. They have a hold co in the US. Even if the IP sits in Senegal, which is OK, by virtue of ownership, the economic interest is held by a US entity. So that's to look at. Then once you're to to Greg's point, once you you know reach a certain number of revenue and can afford to hire lawyers to move your IP, you then do that. The ownership is the important aspect. Do you want to add a few points there? And I want to get Lynn's views on the same question. Yeah. Yeah. No, it just means I mean how you know, could could potentially Singapore provide some sort of a, a conduit for yes. For this? IP part definitely Singapore has a whole strategy on that and France as well. So in our fund we have this very peculiar um, strategy. We work both with A Star in Singapore and uh, with IP managers in Paris. One of our advisors is the ops with IP specialists for the festival. Um, so we, we work on that, but I would say one thing that I would say to entrepreneur, if you have something really specific that's exceptional, registering IPs might be your going to disclose what's in there. So I will say, okay, make a business case, push up your marketing, yep. get attraction, yep, be exactly. the first, huh? yep. get your market share high, and then, um, and then get on with it. Absolutely. Now completely, completely agree. Um, and just sort of, uh, to sort of wind this up as we're running out of time is, let's talk a little bit about exits, right? So most investors that have never invested in a startup tend to unfortunately think like regular investors. So I'm buying a property, I want to see rental income every month, I want to see dividends if it's a listed security. How do we, in French West Africa, change that mindset? And in my humble opinion, the best example is to sh is, is, is the best way forward is to show an example. We 
you talk about your neighboring country, if you talk about the pace tags, the flutter waves, the MCOPAs, the MFARMAs, etc., and say that you have to change your mindset from short term to long term. And dividends are not everything. So any any ideas in this panel, how can we get that mindset to change? Because once that mindset change changes, it's it's it, it, it's it's uh, the butterfly effect. It spreads or a spider effect. How do we change that mindset? As you said, I think the example is that everything um, you are mentioning investment which are not risky, and uh, and people want to see the value of the risk, and that's uh, I think what's the aspect today here in the Bank of Africa, and um, but like every ecosystem, they have their paths, and uh, it's a sign of maturity to see uh, uh, exit, and uh, that's what we saw in Nigeria and. Way is an example here in Senegal, uh, so it's, it's, it means that the ecosystem is maturing. Uh, once you will have some business angel being very rich because they existed their company here in Bank of Africa, I think we have, will have a lot of tons of uh, BA because there are a lot of money here. Yeah, and it's also important I think to mention this is that contrary to popular belief, an IPO or a trade sale or an M and A is typically the only way in which you make money, typically. But just in the last three to four years, the amount of liquidity in the market through secondaries is astonishing. So on average, anecdotal evidence, uh, sorry, empirical evidence, you know, the, the just the last two years, on average, at Series B and Series C, right, there's between five and 25% of rounds go towards secondaries. You will never see this number in a media article. So you will hear, Flutter Wave raises $170 million CVC. What they will not say is that there was a huge amount that went to secondaries. But it doesn't go into the company, so it doesn't make headline news. But a lot of investors make money through secondaries. And that rewashing of capital is super important. It then starts money coming in from the funnel earlier. So I just want to add one last point to this uh, Francophone versus Anglophone uh, debate. Um, and I'll tell a, a story about um, when I met um, Ezra and Shola from Paystack in uh, 2016. And they were the first to ever go to Y Combinator. Really awesome. Um, and what he explained to me is that they went on a process at Y Combinator where they had a speed dating with 50 different investors. And I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs appreciate how many doors, doors you have to knock on in order to get a few yeses. Um, and at the end of the day, Paystack had 40 different investors. And I think until the, the francophone sector kind of is, is comfortable opening to the big tent style of investing, um, we're, we're still going to be kind of uh, beholden to one savior investor coming in and saving the day. And that's not the way it's been done in the, around the world, really, quite frankly, uh, successfully. Great. We've got a lot of questions from the audience. So I'm going to ask folks here to raise your hands. And we've got five minutes. Some sure, there are some questions, no? Any questions? No questions. Right, well, any any parting thoughts from the panelists? On, on, I mean, the whole point of this panel is, you know, how can we make French, Frank of Africa more investment ready? Any parting thoughts? I have a question then. Sure. I don't know why we go there is I'm not seeing too many of the local local African corporates coming as co investors in one million. Like, why is that? I mean, I'm asking a very stupid <laughs> question, but because in Asia, there are so many of them. I, I can give my thoughts on that. So, if you're a bank or an insurance company from a regulatory perspective, this is wearing my old Wall Street hat. I mean, capital, tier one capital requirements make it very hard for you to, to invest into startups. So, I'll give you an example. If you're a bank, yeah, I'll get to you in a second. If you're a bank and you want to invest a million dollars into a tech startup, you have to legally show between four and five million dollars in reserve on your balance sheet that, and this is the important thing, that you cannot touch. You can't even put that in the bank on an interest. So it's literally money in your mattress. So unless, under your mattress, so unless you're a corporate that acquires a 51% stake of a company, 
and then it's classified as an equity affiliate, I'm not sure what the exact term is. So corporates either want to acquire you fully or a majority acquisition, or they cannot. So it's very few corporates in Africa that actually have the ability to do small investments and have a five percent stake in companies. So that's the reason why. I'm um, uh, sorry, I want to just get a quick word in from Dimitri. Uh, sure, I speak fairly loudly. Um, well, I think for some financial system actors, such as local insurance companies, there is a, a fairly new requirement to invest a small percentage into uh, local startups and SMEs, so that's actually a helpful thing for the subregion. Um, I think now on the flip side, the unfortunate part is that, you know, and this is my personal opinion, but quite frankly, most of the banks and most of the corporates, with some exception, just don't really care as much. Uh, you know, they're able to have a high EBITDA margin, they're able to lend profitably to large, the banks are able to lend profitably to large corporates, and it's just not a priority besides just, you know, some positive PR uh, to invest in startups and SMEs. We hope that this will continue to change. Yeah. And I do want to highlight that there are a few positive exceptions, but overall, uh, it's really in need of change. Yeah, you want to ask? Greg? Just, just to, to, to add, uh, Frank of Africa is, is not, uh, I think the, the, the in Africa we have four or five countries are the top countries in terms of the ecosystem, and then we have the rest of the continent, which could be francophone or other other region. Uh, francophone Africa is just an opportunity, but all the other countries have the same issues, and I think they are they are the main two things that we need for to, to build those ecosystem are just seed funding and uh, and um, and more uh, uh, more incubators, more accelerators. And that the two pieces that uh, I'm proving now, and I'm very impressed by what uh, I saw, but uh, I think what we, we mentioned about Francophone Africa is true for for 40 countries. Got it. Well, Mario, you want to add a quick lesson? So, um, clearly, the thing is, with um, Francophone African countries, you do have, um, I mean, a very I mean, small local investment because mainly the active one are investing other way out, right, in other markets. Maybe it's because of the market, because of the, the mindset, you know, blah, 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 there are a lot of reasons. But the thing is, from another hand, we have been seeing a surge of a lot of Asian investors, Japanese investors, that are mainly investing, you know, 100, 100,000 tickets in, in Africa, even globally, even French speaking. You know, uh, the thing is, because in Japan, they have, really a very low risk, but the return on investment is you know, significantly slow. And from another hand, in Africa, of course, the risk is you know, bigger a little bit, but the return on investment because of the markets, because of innovation, which you know, is an opportunity. But for founders or for investors to get access to those capital, they need to get a better structure, you know, calls, you know, um, to demonstrate execution, as it has been said by Tijan, by Zach, by everyone in this panel. So I think we should we should be focusing on how to make you know um, champions on on Francophone Africa. So we don't have you know I, I will say I don't know any champions. Sorry, Ken, but that, that's the real truth. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone. We run out of time, but thank you all the panelists for your contributions. Welcome uh, Matthias 
from Julia, Yuma Fal from Petunia, and Jiba Jao Jalo. And the moderator is going to be Ashwin. So I will ask the panelists uh, to come into the um, innovation and fintech, how other verticals can learn from the fintech success. And uh, a few years ago, I was uh, uh, discussing with a bank in Kenya, and they were uh, explaining um, how technology and fintech help them uh, improve credit scoring for you know, their, their customers, and how uh, a, a woman uh, in, uh, in a village in Kenya can now wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning, then only ten dollars, for example, go to the market, uh, you know, buy the vegetables, come back, uh, sell it, and then got some more money at the end of the day. And to me, it was really interesting. I definitely agree. Banks are definitely the first uh, corporates that uh, uh, are kind of changing their mindset because of, uh, of uh, fintech. And just to mention, you know, there's a question that came to the exact um, uh, panel on you know, why corporates are not financing. On the bank perspective, I'm quite new to the bank, but at least the first thing that I understood is that startups and fintech look strange to banks because they just don't know it. So they are not VCs, they don't know how to invest in these kind of you know, companies, but things are changing, hopefully. So um, I mean, I hope that now we are going to see more and more trends. So that's the first industry. The second one, uh, to me, is insurance, as, as she mentioned, again, for the bottom of the pyramids. Uh, when I think about companies such as Jani in Tanzania or Kula in Kenya that are now enabling all those people who had no idea how uh, insurance, they were not even thinking about it, not being able to have insurance and, and be covered on a health standpoint, so that was really, really um, a very positive point that I saw. And the third one is e-commerce. Um, all we really all know that um, uh, you know, merchants, let's say informal industry representing 80% of the uh, of, of the, 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 the financial uh, transactions in Africa. So being able to uh, to give the, the possibility to all those merchants to have an online presence and also benefit from technology to be to get paid directly digitally, it's also a very good thing for, for you know, all these uh, people that are struggling, you know, uh, getting the, the, the right level of, uh, 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 just make, making it to the right level of, uh, um, um, uh, financial position to be able to improve the way they do. So I think that we, uh, FinTech actually applies to all industries. It's very difficult to say that they have more impact in this or this architect also is, uh, is very impacted. But uh, for me, those two are uh, the ones that I see. Uh, and uh, like for me, like one of the biggest things which I think uh, FinTech is actually going to influence, which I think is a big challenge of the continent, is health. Like, I think it is going to bring about such a convergence of the person and basically service providers, and FinTech is going to be that connection. And again, we're seeing different agencies come out, Ilara, Marsha, Mads, and Pharma, all these companies, and they all operate fundamentally, again, on a financial product, which then they go out to actually sell the pharmacies, etc. And regarding the banks, and again, I'll be very honest, as an investor in these markets, I come from India. And in India, for example, Currently, a simple recharge application for putting airtime back in 2009 is one of India's biggest new banks right now. It's called PTM. Yep. They were basically running the entire monetization. And I can be really honest, that took 10 years. When I first came to the continent in 2014, I have seen banks here evolve four times, five times as fast as Indian banks have. And currently, there is a startup in India which is currently talking about acquiring a bank. So you can, uh, there's a company called Barapay. They're just raising money from a French private, uh, private, private equity company called Centurion. They're putting $300 million to buy a bank. The story is, when will that happen here? Hopefully it's not Echo Bank. We still need Echo Bank around, but the smaller ones, definitely. But I think knowing that this time I've already been instructed with a piece of paper, I want to just touch on one piece, which I think a lot of people here don't understand, which is regulations. Uh, I think, again, regulations is its own mix. It's often uncontrollable by even banks, by even startups. And again, I think we're all facing the same side, and we're all sitting on the same side when it comes to regulations, right? Uh, I would really want to talk to you guys about a little bit of that. Maybe you guys can tell us in your own ecosystems, 
one positive and one thing which is a challenge with the regulations as well. So let's start off with Yuma and then we can come across and then we can hopefully wrap this beautiful panel up. Okay, then I will try to be quick. Um, I think one positive thing for the regulation part is maybe, actually there is no agreement from FinTech on our side, on, the, on our area, but the thing is, uh, we are going to bank, to central bank, we are explaining what we are doing, and they let us continue to innovate. I think this is so, so pretty good, because they can say, no, this is not regulation, this is not safe for us, we are here to be sure that the money uh, can be safe, you can just start to work like that because we can control you, we can make audit on your, on your platform. And I think it's a really positive thing. And about challenges, the things we implement, of course. But I think the biggest challenge will be, we will need agreement more like um, um, E2S, I think it's Europe. When we see like there is kind of agreement for small enterprise, we show that if you are a startup, you can have agreement for 10K, that not have agreement for like uh, mobile money, and you will pay one million of. They need kind of agreement that include the whole ecosystem and not just an agreement for the big um, companies or big operators, I think. Okay, I'm working for a bank, so I'll try to, uh, to keep the regulator on my side. I want to be Okay, just for today. So, no, actually, um, uh, I want to speak about the positive. We all know that there are challenges, but at least we see trends. So I, I recall, uh, I think it was two years ago, the Capital Market Authority in Kenya, for example, opened the sentence. That yeah. was the first one. Yeah. And it was like, okay, now we're going to understand that we all need to go to openness, and it's very good. Uh, we see uh, Ghana, same for Ghana, very recently. Um, Nigeria, yes, we have the issue with blockchain, unfortunately, but at least they've been able to, to allow, for example, QR, they have a standardization of QR for index to enable payment. That's good. I hear about uh, a project with the central bank of UMOA, also working on sandbox. Definitely good choice. Uh, there's a lot of things that needs to happen during the COVID 19 crisis when it was very hot. Uh, they kind of uh, uh, move the caps that they put on many mobile money transactions and, uh, you know, and uh, it was very positive for everyone. So I want to keep that positive trend uh, happening, even ourselves we're having discussion with, uh, I, and when I say regulator, I'm talking about the central banks, but even on my side, within the bank, the internal regulator, we still need to do some work to, 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 to explain that it's not just about risk, there's also opportunities. Uh, I think uh, you already told everything I wanted to say, but maybe just, um, make a comparison. But in Europe, you had the um, what they call DSP1 uh, regulation that was put in place in I think 2012 or 2012, uh, 2010, and then you had um, some countries putting in place regulatory sandbox. Uh, especially uh, UK, the UK, and Denmark, and the biggest fintech in Europe are coming from those countries. So you see the impact, like Adyen from Denmark and TransferWise, all these startups from, from the UK. So you see the impact of this, and as you must say, here in what we call the YMU zone, you have uh, no regulation for uh, fintech payment services, so you just uh, can do it without any uh, overview from the central bank. They will invite you to some panel, they will uh, maybe um, um, ask uh, from time to time uh, some reference for your banks, etc. But they um, don't have a very proactive approach for now. Maybe it's, it will be like changing in the next uh, few months. But I want to say, what I want to say is it's good for you know, to launch your, your fintech startups. But then you've got the trust issue with your customers. And when you want to you know, uh, have the traction with the big corporate, they will ask you, but what kind of agreement do you have? Um, and I think here the gap is being filled by the banks. So the banks are starting to change, they're starting to make you know, partnership with fintechs, uh, especially you see um, in, in the market EcoBank with uh, their uh, um, APIs. Um, for, so, so you have very interesting APIs you can use with EcoBank. I think it's one of the first uh, banks. I don't know, and it's not because Ecobank is here, but <laughs> um, and you see then um, 
the other banks, you know, starting to take some of the risk and saying we cannot reach those type of customers. So we just take the regulatory part and we're just going to oversee what the fintechs do because they are not uh, able to get an agreement uh, or license from the central bank. But other markets are more advanced, like uh, even Ghana, but Nigeria, Kenya, or some uh, North African markets like Morocco, where they have those types of license, like PSP license, which are uh, quite fitted to uh, what some fintechs do in the payment space. Yeah, so I, I was just about to like say, and you mentioned both of you mentioned Ghana. So last year during COVID, the Bank of Ghana Commissioner actually called all investors and all fintechs in the market. And he said one sentence, which actually resonated with me a lot. He was like, there's no one else who's responsible for the citizens' money as much as I am. And that then struck a chord with me because they're basically trying to protect the people. Again, most of us are trying innovation, but innovations often can have both positive effects as well as very negative effects. But at the end of the day, a fintech can always leave the ecosystem. But the Bank of Ghana, the Central Bank of Nigeria, the Kenya Credit Bureau, none of these people can leave. They have to stay there and do their jobs. And because of that, when he launched the fintech office, they got 700 applications in the first three days. Every, like when he said that to us, everyone in the room just got up. We're like, we understand you, sir. We're gonna all send you applications. And now the fintech office in Ghana provides you exceptions. They provide you access to sandbox. And again, these guys, all the fintech office is run by someone who is very corporate, but yet very startupy. He comes from CGAP, World Bank. So again, very very innovative. And I think they're doing. Everyone's doing their own unique way of actually passing the bureaucracy, as we say. Right? I think there was a great panel, I think we all had some great insights, and as people as uh, who we operate on FinTech, I would like, I think, to, for us to give, I think, one tip to the people out there to actually see um, uh, what we get, what, if they want to innovate in FinTech, what would you ask them, or what is the piece of advice you would give? Why don't we start with uh, Eva? It's a hard question, but I can just share what we are doing. The customer needs. Like if you want to innovate or something like that, you just need to listen to my gaps. Yes. Um, it's even harder for me. And the reason why is because I never founded any company. So I always say that I'm not necessarily the best advisor. Or maybe the only thing that I can say is that when I started in the, the startup ecosystem in Africa, my assumption was that as long as you have customer you want, which is not the case, at some point you need funds. You need accelerators. The do those things, so I realized that it was very important, and uh, I've been working with the likes of Toto with FaceTime and all of those guys, and I see the impact now. So um, uh, just leverage all the tools and platforms that you have to make sure that you know, you, you, uh, you have the support that you need to move forward. Um, maybe other, other from what has been said, uh, network with other fintech founders. Uh, because the problems are similar in, in all the markets, even in other emerging markets. So if you talk with them, engage with them, and uh, you will learn much more on what's working, what's not working. Uh, just one example, but I heard from some people in, in Kenya that uh, con consumer credits or nano loans are not as uh, uh, good as the projections were meant to be. and. Uh, when you hear that, you say, okay, maybe not replicate the same mistakes in other more less developed markets because it doesn't work that way. Well. Of course. All right, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Does anyone have any questions from the audience? We have a young gentleman there who's already raised his hand. Hello, everyone. Well, I'm not so, so young. <laughs> Thank you for that. My name is uh, Adamu Musa Saleh. I'm the, the MD. America, where I went for college and started my whole career for about 26 years. And I am now living in Senegal. Uh, for, it's been about two years where I'm back to being an entrepreneur as well as providing uh, coaching services to uh, different entrepreneurs a little bit around Africa as well as the US. So, this is a bit of me, and I'm also a mother of a nine-year-old uh, who's here and watching as she's an entrepreneur herself, and so learning from all these different talks that we're having today. 
So some of the inventions I witnessed as I was as I was growing up. I will I first started with the year I was born and then I decided that would give up way too much information about my age. So I gave it a bit more of a range so you could see a little bit of um, so you could just try to guess. It's somewhere within all of these dates. Um, so it first started in 1973 with the mobile phone. We got the barcode, then we had the supercomputer, personal computer. Obviously, there were lots of other inventions that came up in between, but these were just some that spoke to me. Um, GPS in 1978, 1982, the computer virus was introduced, 1988, the MP3, um, 89, the World Wide Web. Um, I was quite surprised, actually. I always felt like it was way before that and 1999 Bluetooth. So this is just to give you a sense of everything that happened when it came to the digital um, world and all the new things that we introduced. So obviously, I personally was always attracted to technology. I actually used to get in trouble as a child because I was the one that would open up the um, VHS, VHS, VHS tapes. And my father would come and just scream at me uh, for having to open it up. The biggest thing that really always confused me was the VCR. I always wanted to know what is happening inside this box that makes it that this image is then showing on this screen. It was just fascinating for me. So I was always very curious, always interested in learning more and being challenged. And so as my career, I started as a developer. I developed even in COBOL, so that will tell you a little bit of my age as well. Um, did some Visual Basic, did some C++, did some Java, so really went all around the, the world when it comes to programming. But I was really lucky um, to have the opportunity to move to San Francisco. But before I even talk about that, there's something that's not here that I'll go through very quickly as we talk about FinTech. My very first idea was to be able to build a platform where people could pay their bills online This was and transfer money to each other. This was before Western Union let you do it um, via apps and everything else. This was before PayPal, before any of them. I used to live in Miami, where the ecosystem was not necessarily entrepreneurial uh, in the digital sense. And I got scared. The day I got an investor who said, I will put money into your company to build this, I got scared and dropped out of that whole idea. I said, I'm not done for this. I'm not ready for this. I will not do it. As I moved to San Francisco and lived in a building where there were a number of entrepreneurs around me, some of them had succeeded and made quite a bit of money, that gave me the confidence to become an entrepreneur. And so my very first uh, startup was called Music Phone. We built an application that allowed consumers to send songs to each other for their birthdays, to tell them they love them, and everything else. From that, I had deals with different record labels, and then went into launching a music recognition application. This application is what led to becoming uh, what we know today as Shazam as a computer, as a consumer service. Before that, it was called Music ID. It was Pound ID, which is what you would need to dial because there was no smartphone at the time. And Shazam was a UK-based company that was just about to shut down and basically we got the exclusive rights to use their fingerprinting technology and build a consumer application around it. I used to run the service from my home, just don't tell at &T. And so then I actually moved, I was also very fortunate to be associated with American Idol and be involved as I was on the board of the company that had acquired it. I would, we were able to introduce interactive content, meaning connecting a TV show to an online, uh, to an online interface. We, AmericanIdol.com became the 